to Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. Here we explore the training and development of America's leaders in the application of air power and the profession of arms. The views expressed are those of the hosts and do not reflect the official policy or position of the United States Air Force, Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. The mention of companies by name is solely for the purpose of discussion and should not be implied as endorsement. Welcome back to another episode of Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. I am Colin Slade. And I'm Reed Gann, and we're your hosts for Commission Ed. In today's episode, we want to give some of our thoughts and ideas on this idea of Air Force heritage. The motivation behind this is that Memorial Day is coming up, and the typical approach here in America is that people will use this time to honor all members of the military, as well as memorializing those who have passed on outside of the military, you know, their personal friends and family members, which is all great and wonderful. And we think that people should do this. But we hope here with today's episode to draw a little bit more attention to the real purpose and meaning behind not only Memorial Day, but what is our heritage? What is our tradition as members of the Air Force, as airmen, as Air Force officers? Yeah, and Colin, it's something we've done in the past with other major holidays. We tend to become really introspective and think about, well, what is the purpose of this day? And, you know, more of those internal thoughts. And so this kind of wrote itself. It's a little bit of a stream of consciousness. Yeah. You know, we were just kind of thinking about that idea of Memorial Day. What does it mean to us? And it's grown into this heritage concept, which is good. It's something that, you know, we don't have an Air Force instruction. Right. It's something that is taught, but almost by accident. You know, it's <laughs> so we had a saying up on a wall at OTS that like history makes you smarter, heritage makes you proud or something like that. And the idea being that, you know, connecting ourselves to our bigger story matters. Yeah. But. At OTS, we certainly didn't have like major lessons centered around that. We had a little bit of history, but it was really, mm -hmm. you know, airplanes, and then they were jets, and then missiles, and here we are. It was really, really top level stuff. So yeah, hopefully we'll be able to get into a little bit more. There are some resources that we can point folks to to learn some more. Yeah, in my experience with, I don't want to call it training, but learning of Air Force heritage, being taught Air Force heritage is that it has always been somewhat forced. And also my experience as an instructor in the Air Force teaching ROTC, I felt that this lesson, this topic was kind of an afterthought. It definitely wasn't like front and center, like it would be in the Marine Corps, for example, where the fact the Marine Corps was founded in a bar, you know, every Marine loves that piece of their heritage, where I don't know that in the Air Force, every airman loves the fact that we were, I actually can't even say where we were invented. Right. Like, yeah. Where was the Air Force founded short of it came into being as a result of World War Two and then you know the National Security Act of 1947? I mean, that's the most Air Force thing, though, ever. Right. Right. That doesn't make me go rah, rah, you know, <laughs> but that is our heritage. That is the most Air Force thing ever. Well, of course, the National Security Act of 1947. <laughs> exactly. Right. You know, and as we continue to wrap ourselves in AFIs and, you know, the compliance culture that's resulted of that. And that's a whole nother topic. Yeah, but that's also actually part of our heritage. It is. It is. And to be fair, the Air Force has done some things lately to try and, and get after this idea. Yeah. So we do have the PACE, the Profession of Arms Centers of Excellence, a series of videos. And they're really good. They are. Yeah. And if you want to feel a little bit of that, you know, wind in your hair and like feel proud about something, I think they do a good job of capturing some of those things that, Colin, you and guests have explored on how emotional it is to be tied to this thing that we call the United States Air Force. Yeah. And so they do a good job with that. But in that, it explores this idea that the Air Force is very dynamic. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that we're going to get to here in a second, but it was born out of change. If you think about it, armies and navies had been around for a really long time. Forever. Yeah. As long as there's been land and there's been water, there's been an army and a navy. Yep. And so we were born out of this idea of innovation and technology. Innovation and technology changes. 
And so in a sense, we were birthed in change and we're tied to that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's kind of where we're going next, right? Yeah, I mean, in one of those videos that you're talking about from Pace, it says very specifically that the Air Force wasn't built to sit still. And while that's a very good phrase, like it, that's a powerful phrase, but it also hits on the fact that, you know, nothing in the Air Force ever remains constant to include our heritage. And this is emphasized by some things that have happened recently, such as General Brown's emphasis on accelerating change. We need to be different. The Air Force needs to change in order to remain relevant, to remain capable. And what the question, though, is, does that come at the sacrifice of whatever heritage that we may have built up to this point? Yeah, unless our heritage is change. Right. Yeah, we're kind of, it's a circular argument, but it goes at what we're trying to talk about. Yeah, and this actually brings up a phrase that I used to make fun of all the time. So my wife went to George Mason University in Northern Virginia, out there in Fairfax, and the university's motto is, where tradition is innovation. Or it might be the other way around, where innovation is tradition. I can't remember because, to me, those two things are so, like antithesis of each other you know, to yeah. innovate mm -hmm. is to neglect tradition and to emphasize tradition is to neglect innovation and to call that the two are the same really just you know boggles my mind yeah and it feels like that's kind of what we're saying about air force heritage is that our tradition is to innovate yeah or yeah to innovate is our tradition yeah i think the answer is yes <laughs> and we'll highlight that with something that you know happened pretty recently chief of staff announced a change in our mission statement, which is a big deal. Right. So the mission statement has been as long as I can recall, and I'm certainly, you know, it has changed before, but it used to be fly, fight, and win in air, space, and cyberspace. The Space Force is a thing now, and yeah. so totally fair. We need to chop off some of that mission to them. And so now it's fly, fight, and win, air power, Anytime, anywhere. Mm -hmm. Space is gone. Cyberspace is also conspicuously absent. Yep. Because there's no cyber force yet. Yet, right? Is that what is in the tea leaves? Are we leaving that open? Yeah, it makes one wonder for sure. Certainly. You know, when you're thinking about even our mission statement is changing, it's easy to say we have no heritage. Mm -hmm. So, Colin, what is Air Force heritage? We've kind of talked a few things. We've said a few <laughs> things. But what is it? I mean, I don't know, Reed. Like, what do you think of when somebody suggests to you the idea of Air Force heritage? Probably aircraft. I mean, yeah. that should be the first thing that you would go to, right? When somebody says Air Force heritage. And, you know, when we talk about the heritage flights, you know, that is what that is. You know, it's a flying museum of aircraft. Yeah. And then there are actual museums, you know, there's the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum out in Washington, D.C., and there's the Air Force Museum at Wright-Patterson, which that's where you're going and you yep. get to... I'm super excited. Yeah. ...go through that as often as you want. It's amazing. Yeah, and mm -hmm. so I think that that's probably the first thing that people will think of is aircraft in these museums, that is our heritage. And, you know, I identify with that a little bit. You know, I think back to when I first arrived at my first duty station in Washington, D.C. I was at Joint Base Andrews and about 30 minutes outside of Washington, D.C. at the Dulles Airport, there's this annex called the Uvarhazi Annex to the Smithsonian. So it's run by the Smithsonian, but there's so many aircraft that they can't house them all at the National Mall. So they take them out to the annex. And I remember going in there for the first time and seeing the SR-71 Blackbird and the space shuttle. And let me tell you, I giggled like a schoolgirl for oh, sure, because yeah. I was so excited to see these things up front. I mean, the first thing that you see when you walk in the main doors of the annex is the SR-71, and it looks like it's coming at you. Yeah. It is incredible. It looks fast sitting there. It's just a beautiful aircraft. Yeah, and it makes you wonder how many aircraft they have because they are jangled in that place like you would yeah. not believe. I mean, it is pretty incredible. And yeah, absolutely. It's really easy to associate our heritage with technology and with specific pieces of hardware, mm -hmm. which is yeah. funny 
because if we get back to general Brown's accelerate change or lose, we're supposed to get out of this technology specific platform specific mindset. Yeah. But yet, like you and I have said, it's kind of how we identify with the air force. And so it's hard and it definitely leaves that question like, well, what is it? Well, even if it's not a specific platform, it could be around a specific capability, you know, like nuclear power, two thirds of the nuclear triad belong to the air force. Yeah. And I don't know that we're going to innovate beyond that, but nuclear weaponry is a technology that is central to everything that we do in the air force. Yeah. And, you know, Colin, as we've started talking about this and as we are prepping for this episode, the thing that came to mind as we were doing this is, and I've mentioned this before, I joined the Air Force because of the mission of the stuff I was going to get to do. Yeah. But I've decided to stay because of the people. Mm -hmm. It's because of the people that I have chosen this to be my profession. Yeah. And that has started to evolve the way I think about Air Force heritage. For sure. And that's where I want to go right now as we bring in the nexus with Memorial Day. We think about what is Air Force heritage, and I think about what I'm going to remember about the Air Force. And I want to start by reading a very famous poem. You've all heard it before, but it'll kind of get us down the road to where I think we want to go. So this is In Flanders Fields by Lieutenant Colonel John McRae. In Flanders' fields, the poppies blow between the crosses, row on row, that mark our place. And in the sky, the larks, still bravely singing, fly, scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders' fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe. To you, from failing hands, we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. If ye break the faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders' fields. So I'd heard this poem before, but it really didn't solidify a real significance to me until I was in the UK in the summer of 2019. Mm-hmm. So this poem was written in the May of 1915, during World War I, after Lieutenant Colonel McRae lost a close friend in the Battle of Ypres in Flanders, Belgium. And the poppy has evolved throughout the United Kingdom and through, honestly, a lot of the Commonwealth nations to be a symbol, memory of those who have passed away while fighting for their nation. Yeah. And, you know, it was when I was deployed to the CAOC in 2014, you'd see the Brits wearing it on their uniform. You see the Canadians wearing it on their uniform. We obviously don't do that kind of thing, but it was like, wow, this poppy thing is a big deal. I get to the UK. I happen to be there during their Remembrance Day. And I feel like the UK does a really good job of remembering their men and women of arms who have passed away in service of their nation. A real quick read. So Remembrance Day is the British version of Memorial Day. Is that correct? It is. Yeah. That's a really good segue, Colin. A plus, you know, excellent, fully qualified transition. Good job. (laughs) Here we go. Bad AETC instructor jokes, but hey, that's what you come here for, right? Still wearing my badge. Exactly. Me too. All right. So on the 11th day of the 11th month, the United Kingdom celebrates Remembrance Day. That's when the United States celebrates Veterans Day. Now, there's a slight difference in what those are intended to remember. So, Colin, as you pointed out, Remembrance Day is celebrating all of those men and women who have died in service to their nation while fighting for their country for king and country queen and country right now but you know yeah but that's the function of our memorial day memorial day in the united states is to celebrate the men and women who have passed away in service of their country at least that's how it was originally exactly yes instituted that's Uh not how it necessarily functions now exactly not saying that the new way of doing things is wrong that Mm -hmm. we shouldn't remember other people outside of the military but that's not how it was originally created yes Yes. And we have Veterans Day on the 11th day, the 11th month. Mm -hmm. And that is to express gratitude for anyone who has ever served and worn the cloth of the nation. So slight nuance, you know, a little bit of a difference, but it was just very interesting to be there and to be able to participate in their ceremonies and see essentially an entire nation take a knee and have a somber moment 
in gratitude and remembrance. And, you know, I'm going to sound like a crotchety old man, but, you know, I think they do that differently than we do here. And there's good and bad to that. It has a really special tone. And it's something that I had never experienced before. And it really got me thinking about this holiday. You know, as yeah. the holidays coming up, and I started remembering that experience in the UK, you know, Ely Cathedral with just poppies raining down from many stories up, you know, just somber, really gives you something to think about. And I thought, why don't I remember the people who have died as well? Why don't I do that? And I thought about the Air Force. And then I realized, you know, we actually do, Colin, we have some mechanisms that are all around us. Yeah. that help us to do this. And I don't know that enough of us think about it. And that's kind of where I want to go right now, to kind of point out some ways that as an Air Force, we have institutionalized remembering the men and women who've come before us. Yeah, for sure. I mean, before I get into that, I think why is this the case? Why are they celebrating their Memorial Day, their Remembrance Day so differently from our Memorial Day. And, you know, it comes down to just the way that our American society likes to celebrate, you know, for better or for worse, because of our capitalist tendencies, the way that, you know, our economy is structured, holidays tend to get commercialized and they get turned into celebrations, especially during the summertime, you know, that ends up looking like a barbecue and a pool party and all of these other happy-go-lucky types of events, as opposed to the somber, which takes place at the end of fall and the beginning of winter, you know, different times and places of where these holidays are taking place are the reason why they're celebrated the way they are. Yeah. And like you said, some things are great about both. Some things fall short about both. But to get to your comment here about the way that the Air Force has institutionalized remembrance and memorializing those who have gone before, especially those who have passed, like, let's just start with our Air Force bases. Look at what they're named. Look at what they're titled. A great example here is Goodfellow Air Force Base. You've spent plenty of time there, right? Yeah, yeah. So just as a reminder... Goodfellow Air Force Base in San Angelo, Texas. That is where all Air Force enlisted officer intelligence airmen go to get their follow-on training. So after you receive your commission or after you graduate BMT, you will go to San Angelo, Texas and be stationed at Goodfellow Air Force Base for eight months, Reed? How yeah. long is the school? Yeah, officer training is about that, you know, six to eight months. And depending on the enlisted school you're going through, about the same. You know, so everybody's got plenty of time. They're going to spend a good fellow. You go back for training in the future. You know, it's definitely kind of the spiritual home of Air Force intelligence for sure. Yeah. And, you know, it's called good fellow for a reason. It's not San Angelo Air Force Base. Yeah. Though it very easily could be San Angelo. But instead, it's named after somebody for a reason. Yeah, exactly. So it's named after someone who was a local boy born there locally, Lieutenant John J. Goodfellow, Jr., who passed away in World War I flying a reconnaissance mission. So it perfectly aligns with Air Force. It aligns with intelligence. Mm -hmm. And they named it after someone who had a local connection who gave their life in service to their nation. The main gate that you enter is the Jacobson Gate. A1C Elizabeth Jacobson passed away during Operation Iraqi Freedom. She was actually the first security forces airmen to die in combat since Vietnam. Okay. And she deployed from Goodfellow. So she wasn't from the area, but that's where she was stationed and that's where she deployed from in 2005. Then later at the end of training at the time, and I think they still have it, there's a major capstone exercise where they kind of put everything together mm -hmm. and they, you know, really put your feet to the fire and see if you've learned a thing or two. And that building is held in the Schulte. First Lieutenant Rosalind Schulte was an intelligence officer killed in Operation Enduring Freedom in 2009. And actually, my very first assignment was to the very billet that she had occupied three years earlier. And when I moved to Hawaii, the 613th AOC, there were still people there who knew her. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not uncommon for civilians or even some enlisted who are like, yeah, I was here when that happened. And there's a conference room in the AOC named the Schulte. And just right there, that's one base that I've been stationed at, two if you count Hickam. But there's some of my heritage, Colin. 
Yeah. It's in the rooms I am in. It's in the bases I attend. You know, it's everywhere, but I don't know that we see it. Yeah. From the top down, from the base all the way down to the gates, the streets, the building names, the conference rooms, this is everywhere. The heritage of what it means to be an airman and especially memorializing those people that went before us is all around us. Here's another example. So Barksdale Air Force Base, I've been there. I've never been stationed there though. But Barksdale Air Force Base in Bossier City in Louisiana is named after another aviator, this time a test pilot, Lieutenant Eugene Hoy Barksdale. In 1926, he was testing the Douglas O2 for spin characteristics and found himself in an irrecoverable flat spin. So he did manage to bail out of the airplane, but his parachute caught in the wings brace wires. And so he ended up going down with the airplane and his remains are buried in Arlington National Cemetery. He wasn't killed in combat, but we honor him anyway by naming a base after him because of the risk that he took on behalf of the Air Force, but also the information and discoveries he was able to provide to the Air Force up to that point. You know, no one made him get in that aircraft. He didn't have to test out the Douglas O2 for spin characteristics. Nobody said, you have to do this, but he made the choice and ultimately paid the price for it. Yeah. We're thankful for that because now we know so much more about our aircraft and it's because of people like Lieutenant Barksdale who have given rise to aircraft like the F-16 and now the F-22 and F-35, which can basically fly themselves because we know all these things that those test pilots have figured out. Yeah, absolutely. And this isn't to say that every single base and installation is going to be named after someone who died in combat, right? You just gave an example of someone who died in tests and eval, which is still really, really important. And every bit is dangerous. Yeah, yeah. Patrick Air Force Base is named after a major general who lived to a ripe old age, but still contributed to our Air Force. But the point of what we're getting at is as you think about Air Force heritage, as you approach Memorial Day, take a minute and look around. Think about where you're assigned. Think about the streets you're on, the conference rooms you sit in, and think about how many of those have a name. And then ask yourself, do I have any idea who this person is and what their story is? Yeah. And it's okay that you'll probably say, no, I don't. Yes. Because we don't, right? Exactly. That was the realization we had as we, you know, were thinking through all this and having this experience. You know, I knew a couple and then I thought, man, it's bigger than that. It's a lot more. So, yeah. you know, Colin, those of us who've been doing this for a little while, we almost certainly have known someone either very close to us mm -hmm. or, you know, one or two degrees of Kevin Bacon type that have passed away in combat. And the longer you're in, the more likely that is that that's going to happen. Yeah, you will be touched by it yeah. in some form or another. And if you're wondering if that's the case, I think you might be closer to those kinds of things than you think. Yeah, a great example of this is that recently I was at my son's soccer game and as I'm watching him, I look at his coach who happens to be turned away from me and I can see what's on the back of his shirt. And it says, in honor of First Lieutenant Cage Allen. Now, Cage, some of you might remember, passed away while conducting a training mission off the coast of England last year. And I personally never knew Cage, but I was in Air Force ROTC with his brother, Jake. And my condolences go out to Jake and the rest of his family for their loss. We miss Cage. The Air Force misses Cage. And, you know, I said as much at the time, but recognizing the name on the back of the coach's shirt, I had to ask, like, you yeah. know, who is this guy and how does he know who Cage is? And does he have any sort of connection or did he just happen upon a, a cool looking T-shirt, right? Well, it turns out that the coach is Chance Allen, one of Cage's other brothers, just happens to be my son's soccer coach. And I never would have known that, except that Chance took the opportunity to honor his brother and wear the shirt. And then I was willing to ask, right? You know, I could have blown it off and said, hey, no big deal. Not really important to me because, you know, I never knew Cage, yada, yada, yada. But I'm so grateful that I took the opportunity to ask the question 
how do you know Cage? Who is Cage kind of thing? And now I have a connection, a deeper connection to Jake, who I do know, to Chance, who is a member of my community, my son's soccer coach, and also to Cage. I have another connection to an airman who has gone before me, who gave his life for the Air Force, not in combat. He was in training, but still gave the ultimate sacrifice wearing the uniform on behalf of this nation. Exactly. So, you know, Colin, I think that kind of gets us to where we want to end up today. And yeah. so our request, you know, to the audience on this Memorial Day is amidst the barbecues, water parties and furniture sales and movie marathons, take a minute and reflect about those who aren't with us anymore and think about their service and the irreplaceable gift those people have given us. And those mm -hmm. people that are on our street signs and our Air Force bases and our conference rooms. So the next time you go into a meeting and they say, hey, meeting's in the Schulte, I encourage everybody to take three minutes of their day and see if they can figure out what that's named after and maybe connect them a little bit more deeply, more profoundly with our Air Force heritage. Because that's the bottom line, Colin. The Air Force heritage is the amazing airmen that make it. And so that's what we want to leave our audience with today. Yeah. It's not the technology. It's not the aircraft. It's the people. Airmen are our heritage. Regardless of what the Air Force mission is now or will be in the future, regardless of the existence of a space force, a potential cyber force, or any other force that may be created in the future, regardless of what our Army, Navy, Marine Corps brethren and sisters say about our heritage, or even regardless of what we say about ourselves, you know, and how ridiculous we take some of these different things and make things way more difficult than it has to be through the use of technology or the neglect thereof. Our heritage is us. We are the heritage. Those of us who wear the title of airmen are the heritage, and we should honor you, we should honor me, we should honor everybody who has ever worn this uniform and borne the title of airman. That's really what this is all about. Exactly. Awesome. Anything else before we wrap up this week, Colin? Happy Memorial Day. Yep. Happy Memorial Day. May all your takeoffs and landings be equal in number. Thanks for joining us for this week's episode of Commission Ed. Commission Ed.